Good evening. Please Hear this. Here you can. <clears throat> um, uh, good evening. My name is Charles Draper. I'm the chairman of the Herschel Society. Welcome to the 2023 Caroline Herschel Prize Lecture, to be given by Dr. Marie von der Sonder of Leiden University. <clears throat> um, usual health and safety stuff first. We're not expecting to have any fire exercise. Um, if, you, if you hear the alarm, is for real, and your way out is through the doors you came uh, behind you um, and across the, um, the open the open uh, area and into the courtyard where you will then be organized. Um, the Carolyn Herschel Prize lectureship was established in 2018 by our society in association with the RAS uh, to celebrate Caroline's memory uh, by supporting promising women astronomers early in their careers. And this is now in its sixth year. So I have not lots of people to thank for this. One is Professor Fran Baganel of University of Colorado in Boulder who made a major donation to help fund it. And secondly, the RAS, uh, our associates, and uh, providing practical help in making it work. And I'm very glad that Professor Steve Eels, of the uh, Vice President, is here today, and he'll say a few words about it. Uh, thank you very much. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, I think this is a brilliant idea, the Caroline Herschel uh, Lecture. It's, it's great to be collaborating with the William Herschel Society. And I'm really looking forward to this lecture in particular, because a lot of what we do as astronomers is kind of physics, but I think AGB stars, the, end, the ends of the lives of stars, it's so interesting because there's so much chemistry involved and all kinds of interesting things. So it's a great pleasure to be here. So thank you, Charles. Steve, thanks. Um, the other person I, I need to thank is Professor Mike Edmonds, who can't be here tonight, who's the, uh, uh, our vice president uh, and also the RES president. And he was a great help to me in, in enabling the thing to happen and helping the link with the RES. Um, University of Bath uh, for helping us and the, the colleagues here today who are organizing that. And Professor Paula Chadwick of the University of Durham, who is online and you'll hear from shortly. Um, and her colleagues on the panel who actually had the business of selecting the winner. So why celebrate Caroline Herschel? Caroline was born, like her elder brother William, in the mid-18th um, uh, century uh, in Hanover. Unlike him, she was given little education and was destined to a life of, at home of domestic drudgery. William became a very successful musician here in Bath in the 1770s, and he brought Caroline over here uh, both for his sake and for hers. And there, here, here she became, in turn, an effective housekeeper, talented musician, singer, and a tireless observing assistant. Fame from the discovery of Uranus took them both to Slough in the 1780s and close contact with the King's Court. And their days were filled with visitors and their nights with observing. Caroline increasingly became recognized as, as an astronomer in her own right. Um, she got a pension from the king as the first paid female astronomer. William's marriage caused some domestic upsets, but also gave Caroline more time to do observing in her own right. And she made and discovered eight comets and a number of um, other objects as well. Most importantly, William and Caroline invented the system of communicating and recording the observations, and in doing so, pointed the way for astronomers after them in separating out the business of collecting the data and recording it. And that's the way astronomy has developed to the present day. Caroline returned to Hanover after William's death and carried on cataloging her with the night sky, partly to support her nephew, John Herschel's work. And they produced the, the precursors of a new general catalog today, which is in use uh, up to the present moment. Caroline was awarded the RES Gold Medal in 1828 and many other honors subsequently. She made a real mark in, a, in an age where women were almost unknown, where women in science were almost un unknown. I wonder she's such uh, an inspiration to many today. Uh, so much so <clears throat> that the UK and German governments established another prize in her name, um, the Caroline Herschel Medal, uh, two years ago. And that's awarded to a UK German-based astronomer, established researcher um, in astrophysics. So not many scientists have two prizes in their name. Um, I'll now hand over to Professor Paula Chadwick, um, who will talk about the importance of women in astronomy and this year's competition. Paula, over to you. Thank you very much. Can you hear me all right? Yeah. Hello. So um, greetings from Durham, um, which is where I'm based. Um, I'm actually the head of the physics department in Durham, I think because I did something very bad in a previous life. Um, 
I'm also acutely aware that I'm projected on some vast screen at the moment, which is slightly scary. Um, but anyway, um, Caroline Herschel, of course, was um, a great uh, astronomer, a pioneer for women astronomers, and actually the first woman to be paid to be an astronomer. Um, she was paid £50 a year um, by King George III, an amount which she noted was not enough. Uh, which, of course, has been a cry of uh, scientists down the centuries. Um, but nonetheless, um, it's an extraordinary thing um, for her to have been paid to be an astronomer. So this um, prize lecture celebrates her memory by supporting promising women astronomers early in their careers. For all early career scientists, getting that first permanent academic post is the most difficult step. And this can be particularly so for women, who remain a minority in the field of astronomy, at least at present. Giving a prominent public lecture, such as the Caroline Herschel Prize Lecture, is an important point on that route. So the recipient of the Caroline Herschel Prize Lecture is decided by a small committee, which I have the pleasure of chairing. I chair a lot of committees, but I have to say this is definitely the nicest. This year, as every other, we had a high quality field of talented applicants from which to choose. Our winner this year, as you can see, is Dr. Marie von der Sonder, who is an astrochemist. She held a Marie Skłodowska Curie Individual Fellowship at Leeds, and in September of this year, moved to become an Oort Fellow at Leiden Observatory. So you can see that this prize lecture has already worked its magic in Marie's case, which is tremendous. In her application, her commitment to and enthusiasm for the field of astrochemistry shone through. And this is an unusual interdisciplinary topic, as has already been mentioned. She has many publications to her name and has given a number of keynote lectures at high profile conferences in her field. She also has an excellent record of outreach and service to the community, having given several presentations to the public, both in the UK and in Belgium. It's therefore with great excitement that we welcome her to give the 2023 Caroline Herschel Prize Lecture, Dying Stars Seeding the Universe. Marie, it's all yours. Just, just one moment first, my neck. <laughs> We're, we're almost there. Um, the, uh, we have, we will have the lecture will last between 45 minutes and an hour. Um, then we'll have questions afterwards. Um, we have quite a large number of people both in the room and online. So those online, uh, what I'd say to you is please put your questions um, in the Q&A um, section and not the chat. And what you might want to do is put a thumbs up to questions you like to have a better chance of your thought being uh, developed on the day. So without, without more ado, Marie, over to you. Right, okay, everybody can hear me, great. So thank you for the very kind introduction. Um, good evening to everybody here in Bath, but also good evening to everybody online. I know quite a few of my family and friends weren't able to make it here in person, so it's great that they have the opportunity to be here virtually. So I'm very honored to have received the Caroline Herschel Prize Lectureship, and I'm very happy to be here finally in Bath to talk to you about dying star seeding the universe and about astrochemistry more in general. So because this is quite a um, large talk, well, long talk, oh, the clicker, of course, something has to, all right. Okay, now it works. Because this is quite a long talk, I'll start with a brief overview. So I'll begin with talking about astrochemistry. I'll then move on to the astrochemistry of dying stars to end with how we go from dust to us. Now, if you think about astronomy, you likely think about very large things, like very large stars that make our sun look like a tiny marble. Maybe you think about very extreme things, such as neutron stars, which are small, just about the size of the Earth, but they contain two times the mass of the Sun. So these are very dense environments. You can go even denser, you can make black holes, perhaps you're thinking about black holes. Maybe you're thinking on even larger scales, you're thinking about galaxies or even clusters of galaxies. But if we want to understand the intricacies of galaxies, and especially perhaps our own galaxies, and understand where we come from, we shouldn't underestimate the power of small things. By small, I mean very small, atoms and molecules. 
And let's start with a bit of a history lesson. So during the Big Bang, only hydrogen, helium, and a little bit of lithium was formed. Everything else, the carbon in our bodies, the air in this room, the heavy metals in the microphone and the computer, were all forged in the course of stars that died a long time ago. And as they died, they um, expelled their life's work, their ashes back into space, and somehow we ended up with this configuration, our Earth and us on it. And if you want to figure out exactly how we go from all these atoms and molecules, atoms floating around in space to us, um, we should uh, really follow the chemistry that happens along the way. Right. Astrochemistry uh, is the study, of course, of molecules that are present in space. So it deals with which molecules are where, but also how many of these molecules are floating around. Astrochemistry also deals with the formation and destruction of the molecules. So which reactions um, lead to their production, which reactions lead to their destruction. And by doing this, we can also determine how the chemistry and specific molecules influence the structure, dynamics, and evolution of astronomical objects. So that's a very broad definition, but it's also because astrochemistry is a very broad field. Throughout the life cycle of a galaxy, you can identify several astrochemical environments or astrochemical laboratories, if you will. So this uh, image shows the, um, well, a picture <laughs> and a description of the life cycle of a galaxy. So stars are born from clouds of material that occupy the space between the stars. This is called the interstellar medium or ISM. And the life and death of the star is all determined by its initial mass or its birth rate. So we can distinguish two main groups. We've got massive stars, which have a mass at least eight times that of our sun. And we've got uh, low to intermediate mass stars, much like our sun. So massive stars will evolve to become red supergiants, explode as a supernova, leaving behind only a neutron star or a black hole. And in the supernova explosion, they throw all their outer layers back into the interstellar medium, enriching it with like, the ashes from their core. Stars like our sun will also swell up, not quite as much, and they will also expel their outer layers and contribute the fruits of their labor into the interstellar medium, but they will do so in a much more gentle and quiet manner, no, no explosions. And after this has been done, only a white wolf is left behind. So as stars die, they contribute all the heavy elements that they form in their cores back into the interstellar medium, where it forms the building blocks for the next generation of stars and planets. And then this process can start over again. A bit like reincarnation, but more like progressive reincarnation as we enrich as we go along. Right. Astrochemistry is a relatively young research field. The first molecules were detected in the 1940s. They were detected within the interstellar medium, and they were these very simple molecules, so cyanide, Cn. We also have CH and CH minus, so an ion of CH. There's an extra electron attached to it. And their discovery came as quite a surprise because the presence of these molecules wasn't expected, especially from a chemical point of view, because Space isn't the most pleasant environment to be in, especially if you are a molecule. There are two main issues, density and UV radiation. So let's start with density. The interstellar medium is very empty. Uh, there's large parts of it that contain only 10 particles per cubic centimeter. So that's not a lot at all. It's almost a perfect vacuum, not a vacuum though. There's 10 particles per cubic centimeter. And if you compare it to the air in this room, there's 10 to the power 19 particles per cubic centimeter. So 10 really is not a lot. And now for a molecule to form, you need two atoms that bump into each other, stick together for a bit to form a molecular bond, and hence a molecule. But at such low densities, it can take a very long time before you meet another atom to form a molecule with. It can take up to like several centuries before you meet someone else. But time is on your side. You spend about like a few hundreds to thousands of years in such a diffuse cloud. So even though it does take a while, you've got time, you can wait. But then we've got the issue of UV radiation. 
I think it's safe to say that we've all experienced uh, nefarious effects of the sun's UV radiation, namely a sunburn. And that um, despite the fact that our sun doesn't actually radiate that much of its energy in the UV, and also we are protected by the atmosphere that filters out most of the sun's UV radiation. And still, every year I get a sunburn. So if you're a molecule in space, you aren't protected by the sun's uh, by the atmosphere. Um, and um, getting a sunburn as a molecule is a bit more dramatic. So as soon as a UV photon hits you, uh, you will be photo dissociated. So you'll be broken apart back into your atomic constituents. So you're not protected by an atmosphere. And also you're surrounded by all these different types of stars. There's a bunch of suns, but there are also very massive stars around you that shine lots of energy in the UV. So you've waited centuries to form a molecule and then it only takes one photon for it to all be broken apart. So life isn't easy if you're a molecule in space, but still, we see them, they're there, and there's many more of them as well. In the 1960s, the field uh, really experienced a boom, and that's when um, radar equipment that was left over from World War II was repurposed as radio telescopes. And this is an example of such a radio telescope. It's the IROM telescope in the Sierra Nevada in Spain. And it looks a lot like a satellite dish to, you know, for TV purposes. And that's because it's basically the same thing, give or take. And when these radio telescopes came online, the number of detected molecules really uh, started to increase. So here we have the cumulative number of detected, mo detected molecules over time. So we start around 1940, we've got a few of them. And then as soon as radio telescopes came online, we see that there's many, many uh, that have been detected. And as the uh, technology continues to develop, more uh, molecules are detected. And at the moment, the most uh, powerful astrochemical observatories are ALMA, that's the Atacama Large Submillimeter Array. And that's um, located in the Atacama Desert in Chile. And it's an array of 66 single dish telescopes working together as one. And by doing that, you can play a little trick and pretend you have uh, an enormous radio telescope of like one kilometer in diameter, which you can of course not make, but you can play a little trick. And then recently in the James Webb Space Telescope was launched after uh, a long time waiting, but it was definitely worth the wait. So James Webb looks mostly in the infrared. And it's, well, one of its flagship missions is to look at very distant galaxies, but it will also uh, sort of unveil our chemical makeup a little bit more. So yeah, that's quite a step up from repurposed uh, war leftovers. So, this graph shows you the current, like the latest census of molecules detected in space. So you've got the number of molecules versus the number of atoms. And at the moment, uh, so roughly 300 molecules have been detected so far. 300 different types of molecules, of course, not in total. Uh, when I started my PhD roughly nine years ago, there was only like 180 molecules. So things really have been moving fast. And as you can see from this bar chart, most uh, molecules are quite simple and contain two to three atoms. So we've got CH and CN, of course, but also more familiar molecules such as CO, carbon monoxide, H2O, water, all floating around in space. And as we go to like longer molecules, we also find more exotic species. For example, HC3N. And that's three carbon atoms in a row with one hydrogen atom at one end and a nitrogen atom at another end. And that's a very funky molecule that you wouldn't, yeah, that you don't encounter here on Earth. If HC3 were to walk into this room, it would be hydrogenated in no time because the density is so high and there's lots of water flying around in our atmosphere. But in space, the conditions are just right for such funky molecules like HC3N to be present and also abundantly present. You can make this in, on Earth, but well, you need to spend quite some time in the lab and you need to spend quite some energy to keep it alive as well. Now, uh, there's many, and there's also some more uh, complex um, molecules that have been detected, with like seven, eight, nine, well, that's atoms, that's complex to astrochemical standards, of course. The largest molecule detected so far is uh, full, uh, a buckyball, so buckminsterfullerene. 
and that 60 carbon atoms are like organized in this nice spherically symmetric shape. You might be wondering why we go through all this effort of detecting molecules in space, because these observatories are expensive, and also it's very time consuming for an astronomer to go about detecting them in the data. Well, we do this because these molecules are very sensitive probes to the physics of the environment in which they are found. And I already sort of hinted towards it when I uh, was talking about HC3N. For something like HC3N to be formed, you know that you need some density because, well, it's five atoms coming together in one uh, molecule. There need to be some collisions going on. You also know that the UV field shouldn't be too large because otherwise HC3N won't be, well, wouldn't exist for long enough for us to detect it. It would be split apart in smaller components and even atoms. So by detecting certain species, and especially by detecting like, sets of molecules and not detecting others, we can really pin down the physical conditions, the density, the temperature, and the UV fields. And by doing so, we can further, and well, by pinning down the physics, we can further help constrain the structure of these objects, as well as their evolution and their dynamics. So chemistry is sort of aiding to, uh, well, helping uh, to, to better understand the physics. Right, I uh, will now take you on a journey along the life cycle of a galaxy, and let's start at the end with the astrochemistry of dying stars. So here we have our life cycle of a galaxy again, and I will start with the massive star. So these have at least eight times the mass of our sun. And as they run out of fuel in their course, or as they sort of end their adult lives and enter retirement, they will swell up and become a red supergiant. A famous red supergiant is Betelgeuse in the constellation of Orion. So it's very clearly which of these stars is red supergiant. It's the very red star <laughs> right over there. And you can very easily detect or observe Betelgeuse yourself. Um, you can just go outside and look up at the night sky, even from the center of town, that's perfectly possible, as long as there's no clouds, of course. So as um, at the end of its, well, so Betelgeuse is a red supergiant, it's about 700 times the size of the sun, so that, that's really a super giant. And after the supergiant phase, it will explode in a very violent, dramatic supernova explosion. So it will throw out its outer layers all in one go, everything back into the interval, interstellar medium, leaving behind a neutron star or a uh, black hole. And uh, an example of uh, well, the remnants of such a supernova is this guy, SN1987A, Mentov in 1987, and it's a very well-studied supernova, and especially the aftermath of the supernova, since it was the first one to go off in like the modern astronomy era. So there's entire books and conferences on this object, and at the center of it is a neutron star. Another example of the remnant of a supernova is the Crab Nebula. And this supernova went off in 1054, and this was recorded by Chinese astronomers at the time. And at its center is a pulsar, so that's a neutron star with a large magnetic field that's rotating around. And this is all very exciting and speaks to the imagination, supernova explosions, wow, all, <laughs> all very uh, imaginative. But it's important to remember that only a minority of stars die this way. So while it's all very dramatic, but the majority of stars won't die as a supernova. For example, our sun will not experience a supernova explosion. Rather, stars like our sun will again swell up as they leave their adult lives. They will become a giant, not a super giant, so a bit of a swelling, but not quite as much. And they will also expel their outer layers to the eyes, and, but not in an explosion, in a much more gentle and controlled manner by means of a stellar outflow. And the outflow occurs during the asymptotic giant branch, or AGB phase. So this is a very descriptive name for astronomers, but I, I, I agree it's not the best for PR purposes. It doesn't have the same ring to it as a supernova. So yeah, perhaps, perhaps that's why. And this is a famous example of an AGB star. It's um, called IRC 10216, or CW Leo for its friends. 
And this is an image taken in the optical by the Hubble Space Telescope. And uh, you can see these shells of material moving away from the star. So you can see this beautiful outflow originating from the star itself. In fact, it's quite difficult to see the star in the optical because it's hidden by all the material that it's flowing away from the star itself. And to me, more precise, it's hidden by all the dust that is being formed in the outflow. And that's really quite something quite special because we've got a phase transition from gas phase molecules to solid state dust particles. That's very difficult to achieve in space. And the outflows of AGB stars are one of the few environments where you can efficiently produce these solid state dust particles. Now, this outflow is also very large. So this image spans about like 2000 AU, where an AU is an astronomical unit, so that is the distance between our sun and the Earth. So this really is enormous, especially so if you realize that our solar system is only like 100 AU in size. So this is really gigantic. Another famous AGB star is Myra, and this is an image taken in the UV. So Myra itself is here on the right, and it's blowing a bubble in the interstellar medium via its outflow, but it's also moving through the interstellar medium. And as it does so, it leaves this tail of material behind. And this tail spans like 13 light years. So this really showcases how efficient these AGB stars are at enriching or polluting the interstellar medium. In fact, about 80% of all the gas comes from AGB stars, or all the new gas comes from AGB stars. And if you look at newly formed stellar dust, they form 70%. So these stars are really like dust factories that are just blowing all the dust into the ISM. Right, I'll now talk a little bit more about the chemistry within the outflow because they're very rich astrochemical laboratories. So for now, this cartoon only shows the half of an HB star at the left. And the chemistry of the outflow is determined by the carbon to oxygen ratio of the star itself. This is because of the very uh, strong molecular bond in the carbon monoxide molecule. If you put C, well, carbon and oxygen together, they really want to form carbon monoxide. So if you have a star with a carbon to oxygen ratio smaller than one, it means you've got more oxygen than carbon, you can then assume that most of your carbon will be locked up into CO, leaving behind oxygen, so you will have an oxygen-rich outflow. Similarly, if your outflow is as a ratio smaller than one, you will have more oxygen, uh, carbon, sorry, than oxygen. Oxygen will be locked up into uh, carbon monoxide, leaving behind carbon, a carbon-rich outflow. Now, all stars start out as oxygen-rich. Our sun, for example, is oxygen-rich. During the AGB phase, there is a process that occurs that dredges material from the center of the star up to the surface. And as it does so, it dredges newly formed carbon up to the surface, so slowly increasing the amount of carbon that we can see at its surface. And after a while, your star will topple over from oxygen-rich to carbon-rich. Now, not all stars will become carbon-rich. This depends, again, on your initial mass, which really determines everything. Um, so you need to have, you need to experience enough dredge ups in order to become carbon rich. And our sun will never become carbon rich. She will all say, all, well, it will always remain oxygen rich. Right. These stars are uh, very turbulent things. The outer layers are convective. So they're like a huge pot of water that's boiling over. And this is a simulation of such an AGB star. You can see these beautiful uh, convective cells that move up and down. And as the cells move up, they also push material away from the star, which I think you might be able to see <laughs> in the light. Um, so as these, these convective cells move material away from the star and they create this extended atmosphere or the inner part of your outflow or winds. And these um, pulsations cause shocks within this inner wind because as material is being moved, well, material is pushed up, but it also falls back down and then bumps into other um, stuff that is being pushed away. It's a very turbulent environment. And these shocks take the chemistry out of equilibrium. And this breaks apart the CO molecule. So you've got a bit of carbon and oxygen floating around over there. 
a little bit further out, the density is still high enough, but the temperature is low enough for dust to condense from the gas phase. And this is really one of the things that make AGV stars so special, this condensation of dust grains within the outflow. And the dust, uh, well, the type of dust depends, of course, on the type of chemistry. If you've got an oxygen-rich outflow, you will create silicates or metal oxides, so sand grains. Carbon-rich stars create lots of amorphous carbon, which is basically soot. These carbon-rich stars are enormous combustion engines and creating loads of soot. And the dust is opaque to the infrared radiation of our star. And this means that, as it, that it easily absorbs the infrared photons coming forth from the star. And as it does so, it, the momentum of these photons is transferred to the dust grains. This makes them accelerate away from the star. And as they move away, they bump into the gas, drag it along and launch the outflow. So you have got your stellar pulsations that create a perfect environment for dust condensation to occur. And as soon as dust condenses, we've got our stellar outflow launching material away from the star into the interstellar medium. And even though this dust is clearly very important to understand exactly how stars like our sun die, because as soon as this dust is formed, we've got the outflow. And as soon as we, leave, we start to lose our outer layers, well, that's basically the end of the star. But even though the dust is so important to understand stellar evolution, we don't fully know how it is formed yet. So we don't know how we go from gas phase molecules to larger gas phase clusters of molecules that then condense into a solid state particle. We've got some ideas, of course, but like the details are yet to be figured out. So yeah, it's a, uh, but we do know that the dust is there. <laughs> we can detect it and the outflow is clearly being launched. So afterwards we enter the outer regions of our outflow where the material reaches its terminal velocity, somewhere between five and 30 kilometers per second. So that sounds quite fast, but in astronomical standards, it's quite a slow wind. And the chemistry in this region is quite similar to that of the ISM. You've got lots of UV photons and they create a very reactive soup of molecules, atoms, and ions. So I again would like just to point out how large these things are. So first of all, first of all, the AGB star itself will have a radius of about one AU. That doesn't bode particularly well for the Earth. So either the Earth will be swallowed whole or things will get nice and toasty. But that's nothing to worry about just yet. We still have some four billion years before that happens. But well, it, it will happen anyway. And the outflow itself ranges all the way from the stellar surface to where it merges with the ISM several thousands of AU later. Because it's an outflow, we've got these large gradients in density and temperature. So we go from 10 to the 13 particles per cubic centimeter in inner wind. So that already sounds like a bit more, but it's still a million times less dense as the air in the, than the air in this room. And then the density decreases all the way to some 10 particles per cubic centimeter, where the outflow merges with the ISM. And similarly, in temperature, we go from a few thousand Kelvin close to the stellar surface to some 10 Kelvin at the end of the outflow. And it's precisely because of these gradients that we have such a rich and varied chemistry, and that we also can have dust uh, formation within it. So it's a uh, uh, the AGB star as an astrochemical laboratory, it's actually three in one because you've got three types of chemistry. Now, you would think that a nice spherical star would give rise to a, a spherical outflow, so sort of like a bubble being blown into the ISM. However, observations have shown, I've already seen quite a few interesting shapes. For example, this spiral around our scope Taurus. So this is an image taken by ALMA. What you see here is emission of carbon monoxide. So overall, it, it is very cool, but it's very clearly a nice Archimedean spiral present within this outflow. Another nice example is L2 Puppis. This is an image taken in the optical. So this dark band that you see here is a dusty disk seen edge on. And this dusty disk hides the star from um, our view. And these two cones of light are light that's being, it's light that's being scattered off the dusty disk. 
Now, if you combine that with all my observations, they are uh, here in red, you see that there is a planet present within this dusty disk. And it's a planet of roughly about a Jupiter mass. And uh, it would be about right where uh, Uranus is in its orbit. And this is a bit of a, a glimpse into our future, because all two puppies used to be very similar to the Sun. And we also have a Jupiter mass planet orbiting around the Sun, na namely Jupiter. So perhaps this is what our Sun will look like in a few billion years when it loses its outer layers. Well, might have an outflow surrounded by a dusty disk. So a glimpse into the future. As more and more high resolution um, observations are being made, it's becoming clear that these spherically symmetric outflows are the exception rather than the rule. So here I show you 12 uh, oxygen rich HB outflows, again, emission in CO. The red is moving away from you and the blue is moving towards you. None of these stars have spherically symmetric outflows, some a bit more so than others, like these, for example, seem reasonably well behaved. But then you also have like a, a bipolar structure, an hourglass, as well as some sort of a space rose over there. Uh, there's, there's a lot going on and none of it is, seems to be easy. <laughs> And we now think that these very intricate structures are being formed by binary interaction. So interaction of the, of the star and the outflow with a companion. Because most stars actually have a stellar companion, like a friend orbiting around them. Our sun is actually quite unique in that it's a solo star. Most other stars have another star orbiting around them. But even if you don't have another star, you maybe have a massive planet such as Jupiter orbiting around you. And these stars or planetary companions are massive enough to really shape the outflow into these intricate structures. And that sort of feeds into the next stage in stellar evolution, namely the planetary nebulae phase. Um, so after the outflow is being lost, so the outer layers are gone, the only thing that's left behind is a white dwarf. The white dwarf is able to light up the, 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 like the bits of the outflow for a brief period of time, just 10,000 years, and it creates these very beautiful shapes that have long been known. So these are all images taken by Hubble. And you've got some very interesting shapes here as well. You've got like the cat's eye nebula, uh, so like, like two, two rings going on over here. And then you also have the red rectangle, which is a red rectangle. So that's all very strange. And now we think that these very interesting structures are already being formed during the AGP phase. So yeah, that's uh, going to be the end of our sun. <laughs> and planetary nebulae are actually connected to the Herschels and also to Caroline Herschel. So part of Caroline's research was performing sweeps of the sky. Uh, to, in order to detect nebulae, so clouds of material floating around in the interstellar medium. And she found quite a few uh, with just a quite simple telescope. And uh, she showed to her brother William that if you were to use a more sophisticated telescope, you would detect many, many more. And that sort of started their, uh, well, their famous catalogue of nebulae. But William also encountered this guy, the Saturn Nebula, and he described it as a curious nebula, or what else to call it, I do not know. And a bit later, he wrote to a French astronomer that these objects seem to be planets of the starry kinds. Because he, of course, didn't know that he was looking at a death rose of a star like our sun. And he called it a planetary nebula. Because, well, he didn't know what else to call it. And we still call it that uh, to this day, because in astronomy, we, like, we, we don't like change as much, and we stick to our uh, terminology. So a planetary nebula, thanks to William Herschel. So finally, finally, our star is dead. It has ejected all its life's work back into the ISM. Lots of gas, but also lots of dust. And while the life of the star may be over, the journey of the dust has only just begun. And this dust plays an important role to the physics and chemistry, both of the interstellar medium and then further along to star and planet formation. So let's hop on to a few of these dust particles and move into the ISM. Right. So the interstellar medium is 
quite empty, but there's also regions with a higher density. And this is one of them. It's called a dark cloud, well, because it looks like there is a hole in the sky with no stars present. Now, because of the higher density, so 10,000 to a million particles per cubic centimeter, this means that there's also quite a few dust grains lying around. And much like how the dust obscured the AGB star from our view, it's also hiding whatever is going on behind this cloud from our view. Now, this uh, dark cloud, Barnard 68, is on the verge of collapse. It's going to collapse under its own weight sometime in the next 10,000 years. And when it does this, it will become a stellar nursery. So new stars will be formed within this cloud. But we can play a little trick and switch to a longer wavelength, for example, the infrared, and see peek through the dust. And indeed, there's lots of background stars. It's not a hole uh, in the sky. Um, so this really showcases the ability of dust to shield against visible as well as UV lights. And that's a very important quality for dust to have because this means that it can act as a sort of sunblock to the chemistry that goes on inside of this dark molecular cloud. So dust has some sort of a, a, a makeshift atmosphere, as you will. And because of this ability of dust to block UV light, we can distinguish different types of chemistry through the ISM. So in the diffuse ISM, we have a very simple chemistry, mostly atoms, uh, and also ions, but also very simple molecules such as CH and CN, the ones that started the entire astrochemistry adventure. But of course, we also have uh, H2, which is the most abundant molecule in the universe because, well, <laughs> Uh, well, uh, there's uh, like about 50, no, 75% of all matter is hydrogen. So that makes H2 the most abundant molecule. CO, carbon monoxide, is the second most abundant because there's quite a bit of carbon and oxygen flying around, but also because of this very strong molecular bond that CO has. And when we go to larger densities, we see some longer molecules popping up, for example, water, as well as HCM which smells, so hydrogen cyanide, smells of bitter almonds, and it will also kill you very quickly. We've got formaldehyde, uh, as well as another, well, more of these funky molecules such as C4H. So four carbon atoms in a row with one hydrogen at the end. Like, it's very difficult to find here on Earth. But we also have like actually complex molecules, even orga organic molecules flying around. For example, formic acid, so that's what makes bee stings hurt. We also have ethyl formate, which smells like raspberries and tastes of rum, as well as methanol. So the simplest alcohol, it will make you drunk, but it will also make you blind after a while. So user beware. So these molecules, these complex organic molecules, well, complex in astrochemical terms, of course, are just flying around in the interstellar medium. But it's very difficult to explain just the amount with which we observe them by using gas phase chemistry only. So, so molecules and atoms flying around and bumping into each other. In order to explain just the abundances with which we see them, we need to go to our friends, the dust grains again, because the dust forms uh, uh, the surface of the dust acts as a meeting place for atoms and molecules to meet each other. So this animation will show you how uh, the complex organic molecules are formed. So we've got CO particles and hydrogen um, atoms stuck to the surface of the dust. So that's the white ones are hydrogen and hydrogen doesn't weigh a lot, so it can zoom around the surface. And while I was talking, we have the formation of methanol. A carbon monoxide molecule arrives from the gas phase onto the dust, and you've got our little hydrogen atoms, beep, boop. And even though they're well, they're much heavier, they can, but they can. These molecules can still move around on the surface, just a bit slower. And so methyl formate was just being formed. Another CO molecule arrives from the gas phase, and these two HCO guy radicals meet and form some uh, another radical and some hydrogen atoms leap to the opportunity and form glycol aldehyde. Right, so another CO molecule arrives from the gas phase and hop, an hydrogen hops on. And now 
we have a UV photon that hits our methanol and knocks over hydrogen. And now these two radicals eagerly come together and form another complex organic molecule. Again, this takes quite some time, but we, we do spend, spend a lot of time on this dust grain. So over time, your dust grain will become coated with an ice mantle formed of these complex organic molecules. And as the dust grain is incorporated in a star forming region, it gets heated up and the ices are evaporated off into the gas phase. And that's why we see these complex organic molecules with such large abundances. They were formed on the, on the dust grain, and as the dust was heated up, they were well, ejected into the gas phase. So dust acts both as a UV shield, as well as a meeting place for molecules to form. So after a while, our cloud collapses. It can't bear its own weight anymore. Perhaps a supernova went off in the distance and gave it its final push. And as a star, as a cloud collapses, stars are being formed. So this is an artist's impression of such a protostar. So a star is being formed, surrounded by a disk of material that is still like falling onto it, accreting onto it. And this disk is called a protoplanetary disk because, well, this is where planets are being formed. And we now know that planets are a very normal side product of star formation. And you start forming a planet by well, having dust grains sticking together, forming a larger dust grain, and then you've got a little stone, and you've got a larger rock, and before you know it, you've got yourself a planet. Now, of course, the details of planet formation are still unknown, but we do know that it all starts with dust grains. And these days, um, observations are as good or maybe even better as artists' impressions. So these are some protoplanetary disks observed by ALMA, and you see here emission of their dust grains. And there's quite a few um, smooth looking protoplanetary disks, but you also have uh, ones with dark rings or even dark bands within the disk. And we think that these dark bands are gaps that are being carved out by planets that are forming within these disks. So what you have here, have here is like a, a just a picture of a planetary system being formed, sort of like a 20 week scan of a planetary system around a distant star. You can also take a look at the molecules. So here at the top, you again have the dust. And at the bottom, you've got emission of three uh, different molecules. So HC3N again, CH3CN, which is methyl, uh, no, vinyl cyanide, uh, which is uh, used on Earth as a monomer to form synthetic rubber. And then also a, a, a cyclical one. So three carbon atoms in like a little ring, uh, as well with uh, like two hydrogen atoms tangled along. You can see here that the dust and the gas trace different regions within this disk. The different molecules also trace slightly different regions between uh, themselves. So by studying the chemistry of these disks, we can better characterize the physics, so we can better understand exactly how planets are being formed. But also by characterizing the chemical composition of your disk, we can start to maybe make predictions as to what sort of planets are being formed within these disks. Are they similar to Jupiter or maybe similar to ice giants such as Uranus? Or maybe they might be similar to our Earth. That's all encoded in the chemistry of these disks. Now, the planetary system you know best is, of course, our very own solar system. And this is a very zoomed out image of the solar system. So on the left, we've got the sun. And on the right, we've got our nearest stellar neighbor, Alpha Centauri. And there's quite a lot shown on this figure. Of course, we've got all the planets, but we also have lots of remnants from our uh, planet formation. So we've got the uh, asteroid belt between Mars and Jupiter. You've got the Kuiper belt, which is uh, located behind all of the planets. And then you have the Oort cloud that surrounds it all. Now, sometimes some of these uh, re remnants from planet formation um, falls on top of the Earth. Most of the time it's okay, it's just a small meteoritic impact. Sometimes all of the dinosaurs die, so it's a bit hit or miss. But we also have more distant and more friendly uh, visitors, namely comets. And these comets come from more distant parts, so the Kuiper belt or the Oort cloud. 
and they come by every once in a while. For example, the comet Halley uh, comes by every 75 years or so. Now, these comets are thought to be very pristine remnants from the disk from which the Earth is formed. So by studying a comet, you can, it's like studying an historical artifact. And Charles already mentioned it. Uh, Caroline Herschel discovered eight comets, and this is a cartoon that was published after she discovered her third. Uh, it says the female philosopher smelling out a comet. And you've got Caroline over here who says, what a strong sulfur smell proceeds from this meteor. And the uh, comet over here is farting in her direction. Uh, now this, co well, this comet, well, um, yeah, the image was clearly made, um, meant to make fun of her, because, well, the comet is farting in her face, which admittedly is quite, quite fun, but I've got a primitive sense of humor. But also she calls it a meteor, while it's a comet. And well, she knows because she's the one that discovered it, right? So yeah, uh, she was made fun of for doing the, well, following the very unwomanly, unladylike pursuit of astronomy. And I'm quite happy to, uh, that. well, whenever I publish a paper, nobody publishes a comic like this, at least not that I know of on a pub, <laughs> uh, nothing in a newspaper or anything. So yeah, there's been quite, there's been some progress, let's say. All right, on to more, fun topics, namely comets. So studying comets tells us a lot from, uh, or tells us a lot about our very own solar system as it was being born. And for that reason, the European Space Agency sent a mission to a comet, 67 Churyumov gerasimenko or 67P, and in 2014, it's reached its destination. Here we have it. So this is a nucleus of the comet. Now, they might have um, heard comets been described as dirty snowballs. Well, that's not, that's not a ball. That's two things sticking against each other. So that already tells us a little bit about how it was formed. And then you also have these rays emanating away from um, the surface. And this is material that's being outgassed of the surface. So as the comet comes closer to the sun, it heats up and all the ice is on the surface well, are released into the gas phase. The Rosetta mission also took this sequence of images. And uh, um, this, is, uh, this is the surface of the nucleus. So over here, you've got a cliff, which is about a few tens of meters high. You've also got some rocks lying around on the surface of this comet. And lots of the stripes that you see here are cosmic rays hitting the detector, where the more fluffy bits are actually um, like snow particles floating around on the surface of your comet. So here we've got the geology of your comet as well as the weather, which I think is pretty amazing. Right, Rosetta sniffed out the composition of all the material that was being outgassed from the nucleus and it discovered a real zoo of molecules. So you've got um, uh, quite smelly ones, so lots of co molecules containing sulfur, also with ammonia, you've got poisonous ones, you've got uh, all the alcohols, long carbon chains, but the king of the zoo is glycine. And glycine is the simplest amino acid. So that's the simplest protein that's essential for life on Earth. Forms on the surface of a comet, just purely via astrochemistry. And that sort of feeds into this theory that life on Earth might have an extraterrestrial origin. Because the early Earth experienced quite a heavy bombardment of all these, like, well, all the those rocks flying around at the time. And if these meteors and comets were covered in an icy mantle, and if this icy mantle contained complex organic molecules, including glycine, perhaps even very simple sugars or fats, these molecules might have kick-started the formation of uh, life on Earth. So perhaps an extraterrestrial origin, right? <clears throat> so when you think about star and planet formation, how we go from dark clouds to protostars and protoplanetary disks to finally something like our sun and the Earth, shouldn't forget that it's uh, dying stars that have provided the building blocks for this entire process. So the, as they die, they, they provide a lot of dust for all of the other 
some bits to happen. And astrochemistry really is essential to understand exactly how these stars die, because it's the chemical process of dust formation that launches their, out their outflows that enriches the ISM. And we still don't know how the dust is being formed, so this means that we still don't know exactly how these stars die, but also that we don't know uh, the composition of all the material that's being uh, contribute that's being well, pushed out into the interstellar medium. And astrochemistry also, of course, plays an important role throughout this process. And well, yeah, as the detection of glycine on a comet shows, perhaps even well, astro perhaps astrochemistry holds the key to life on Earth. Maybe life is just a chemical byproduct of planet formation, if you're lucky enough. Right, I'd like to end by saying that astrochemistry isn't just observations. Of course, it's a large part of it, but you also need laboratory experiments. Uh, these laboratory exper experiments are essential for the astronomer to uh, detect and identify the molecules within the observations, but they're also essential to sort of better understand the chemistry within the interstellar medium and all the other environments. Because in the lab, we can sort of mimic uh, the conditions in space and we can see how fast things go, which sort of molecules are being formed or destroyed. Now you also have theoretical models that are very important to astrochemistry. And these chemical models try to uh, mimic the chemistry within an astrochemical laboratory uh, by taking all the data provided by laboratory experiments, trying to fashion it into an AGB star and compare it to observations. By doing so, we can better interpret the physics uh, of these environments, but also, well, more often than not, the model and the observations don't match. So then the observations tell the modeler that you need to include maybe new physics, new chemistry. So you have to go back to your friendly chemist and ask for more information. These three <laughs> components are equally important and they all rely on each other. So there's many ways to become an astrochemist and there's many ways to help contribute to answer the question of like the big question of where do we come from? Right, and I'll end my talk with this slide, which was taken, so this image was taken by the Voyager 1 mission, right when it was about to leave the solar system on Valentine's Day of 1990. It looked back one last time and took this picture of our Earth. And if you can't see the Earth, it's this pale blue dot right over there. And this is really a group picture of all of humanity, because everybody who was alive at the time or had already died is in this picture, as well as everybody who didn't exist at the time yet, so including myself. Because all the material that is essential for us to exist is all here in this one pixel, or maybe a couple of pixels. All the chemical elements that were forged in the cores of stars that died a long time ago and were brought to us by a sequence of physical and chemical processes. All right, and here we are. All right. And with that, I'd like to end my talk. Thank you very much. I'm going to do the same way again. Thanks for first in a room. Please put your hand up and Gemma will bring the mic to you so you can all hear them. Uh, who wants to go first? <laughs> Thank you. Can I be heard through my mask? Yes. <laughs> Thanks. Um, because you're an astrochemist, um, it's it's a bit of physics as well, actually. Mm -hmm. uh, the outflows that you were talking about right at the beginning were mainly carbon and um, oxygen mm -hmm. atoms. And these are the basis of uh, life forms, basically. Mm -hmm. So um, I'm just curious to know, I mean, is there a sort of what is the physical and chemical um, basis for um, these two, for, for the predominance of these two particular life forming uh, ah. um, uh, atoms. Right, yeah, thank you for your question. Thank you. Um, well, 
It all has to do with exactly how these chemical elements are formed in the core of a star. So that's a field of research that's called nucleosynthesis. So most, well, about 75% of everything and 25% is, 75% well, is hydrogen and everything else is roughly helium. And in the core of a star, hydrogen is being fused into a helium atom. And this liberates quite a lot of energy. And that's also why stars, well, the sun is currently fusing hydrogen in its core, producing helium. As soon as you run out of hydrogen in your core, you run into a bit of an issue and you become either a red supergiant or a red giant. And then you start to fuse helium forming the next element in line, carbon. Actually, I've got a bit of a, a slide. <laughs> so you move your way down the table, or, well, the periodic table. So you go fuse hydrogen into helium, and then we go from carbon, we can make nitrogen, and oxygen, and you just smash smaller atoms into each other to create larger and larger atoms. And that's how um, everything is being formed up until iron. Once you hit iron, you run into an issue because if you smash these larger atoms into each other, you actually lose energy. That's also why on Earth we do nuclear fission rather than fusion. So if you've got a uranium, oh, where is it? Where is it? Of course, now I can't find it. <laughs> so you've got a uranium atom. If you, um, if you split that apart, you liberate energy. But everything else, everything up to iron is being fused in a core that way. So simply because you start out from hydrogen, uh, you form helium and then you form carbon. So that's why we've got carbon and oxygen that are so abundantly present. Yeah. Can you use boron? Can I... uh, yes, please, boron. Uh, ah. <laughs> ah, because that's a bit of a, a bottleneck if you go through the nuclear fusion uh, process. So there's, there's lots of <laughs> physical details that I, I won't go into, and I frankly also don't know the details of. It's been a while since I studied that. But so you can see that beryllium and boron are a bit of a, the odd ones out. So they're sort of a step that's being skipped while, while you fuse elements. But yeah, they're still being formed because all the things fall apart. So I hope that sort of answers your question. And it just leads me to the conclusion that um... Okay, yeah, I can, I can. Hear. So that life could form. Oh well, well, yeah. It depends on, on what you think of, uh, on how you interpret how it's designed. But yeah, yeah, all the ingredients are there for life as we know it to form a carbon-based life form. There's lots of carbon. Yeah. yeah. Another question. Yeah. Hmm. That was a great talk. Oh, thank you. Thank you very much. And um, what happens to the um, the white dwarfs? Ah. Great. So the white dwarfs uh, keep shining for a while, uh, but slowly but steadily they will fade out. Now this takes a very long time, and um, once this happens, the white dwarf will go to become a black dwarf. But this takes such a long time that none of the white dwarfs that have been formed so far have become black dwarfs. So it's a uh, because white dwarfs are quite a peculiar state of matter. It's a degenerate form of matter. Uh, and that's also why they behave in this really strange way and take such a long time for them to peter out. But they will peter out in billions of years and become a black dwarf and then just a, a lump of carbon and oxygen. Just, yeah. I think so, yeah, mate. Yeah, 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 yes. Yeah. <laughs> like a huge diamond. <laughs> Um, a great talk. Um, I was really taken by the idea that you deliver, a comet would deliver all these sort of fairly complicated biological molecules to the Earth. Mm -hmm. Does, has anyone done any work on on how those then would kind of interact to get more complicated things? Um, right. So you've got, of course, the, like the famous um, experiments, oh, but of course, right now I draw a blank uh, of uh, uh, from in the 1970s where they just created these organic soup and shot lightning into it. Um, so starting from like an atomic composition, through thing I can see what happens. So um, I don't know of any, well, there must be something, but I, I don't know, can't think of any papers on the top of my head, but I recently saw someone, something pass by uh, uh, that discuss the survivability of these atoms because, of course, everything will be heated up yeah. over these molecules. But apparently, so a fraction might survive. So that lends some credibility, some further credibility to the theory.
but then if you have some of these complex molecules in your very reactive earth, perhaps. But according to one study, a fraction might survive. So people are working on it. <laughs> and can you say a bit more about um, how the detection of these very complex molecules is done? Aha, aha. I, of course I can, I've got some slides. <laughs> so that's... <laughs> no, not yet, but I, well, it's, it's a good question. So um, these molecules are detected uh, via spectroscopy, and spectroscopy uh, makes use of, well, so, well, I'll just explain this slide first. So if you shine white light through a prism, uh, the light will be um, split into the its constituent wavelength components. So you've got the colors of the rainbow. You've got red here with long wavelengths, uh, and uh, you've got the violet with very short length. And so it will be dispersed through the prism. And if you uh, take a spectrum of a star, just like a cloud of gas, you will of course see the uh, rainbow, but you also have these bright bands of uh, light within the spectrum. And these lines are called emission lines because well, they're a bit brighter than your continuum. And every uh, element in this case has sort of a signature of lines of emission lines. So if you see a line over here and over there, you know that you're dealing with hydrogen. And then if you go to like more heavier uh, atoms, you um, get more lines. But if you see this collection of lines, you know that it's oxygen. Now this is all in the visible because it's like in the, you see the rainbow. And for atoms, um, what you see here are electronic transitions. So that's when an um, electron goes from a higher energy state in your atom to a lower energy state. And then if you go through all the quantum mechanics of it all, which is also why I didn't include it in, in the talk, because you get distracted by lots of uh, equations. Well, I wouldn't show any equations, but you get the gist. So by quantum mechanics, via quantum mechanics, we know that your atom, well, your electron can be at this energy level or that energy level, but nothing in between. So when it goes from one to the other, it, shine, uh, it emits a photon with a specific energy, a specific frequency or wavelength. So this is all encoded in the physics of your um, atom. And then for molecules, um, we can also use the fact that they rotate, for example, uh, here we've got water, so well, maybe like a, I can more easily pretend to be a uh, bimolecular, biatomic molecule. So if you're CO, for example, and you rotate around, you can only rotate at specific frequencies. You can go this fast or that fast, but nothing in between. So if you go from one rotational energy state to another, you again emit a very specific photon. And this happens at longer wavelengths, so in the radio. That's why we use radio telescope telescopes and you also have vibrational transitions so if you are for example something like water you can vibrate at this frequency or that frequency but nothing in between so again you have these vibrational transitions that occur um, also like in submillimeter infrared a little bit more so that's how we do it every molecule has a very specific fingerprint in its spectrum for molecules we can look at electronic transitions, but then you need very high energies and the ISM is quite cold, so nothing is heated up enough. But you can look at a radio because even if things are cold, they're still rotating around a little bit. That is very, very complex ones. Yes, but then things become more complicated because as you add in more, more and more um, atoms, your spectrum becomes quite crowded. So you get more and more lines. So that means that you need better and better uh, spectrographs in order to disentangle all these lines, because otherwise it would all be blended into one big chunk. But if you've got a very precise instrument, you can disentangle them a little bit more. So that's also how, as technology improves, we can really find more and more uh, complex molecules. Yeah, thanks. thanks. Well, thanks. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you for the talk. Uh, what happens to electron stars once, well, 
what happens to electron stars sort of over time. What do you mean with uh, by electron stars, like a white dwarf or neutron stars? Or... Neutron, neutron stars, oh, I neutron mean. Stars. Oh, sorry. Oh, right. Um, well, <laughs> so <laughs> uh, neutron stars aren't really my expertise, but I assume that much like a white dwarf, they will also uh, radiate. But you've kept, so if, if so, imagine, imagine you've got a white dwarf, holes for white dwarfs, holes for neutron stars as well. So it's a very precarious balance of matter. It's very degenerate. So a neutron star is a very it's a degenerate state of neutrons. Uh, that's also why it can be so dense. But if you, for example, have, still have a companion star orbiting around you and that loses matter onto you, you can still explode and go supernova. So it sort of depends. Either you go supernova because somebody is dumping all its mass on you, or you just peter out slowly. Thank you for your talk. And uh, my my question is probably a bit uh, deviating. It's not that scientific. So uh, there's this very popular saying recently I heard uh, saying um, all the gold we have on Earth were in fact generated. In fact, uh, they were all alien. They're all alien. They were generated from the outer space. To mm -hmm. what, ex what extent do you think that is correct? Well, so if you look at this uh, periodic table, you can also see all the, the, the origin of each element. And I think like it's it's the same thing as saying that uh, we're all made out of stardust, right? I think that's, that's true because all the carbon and the oxygen, they were all formed in the cores of stars or in the outflows of dying stars. If it wasn't for... Um, well, out of space, we wouldn't be here. So alien origin in the way that, uh, well, the gold was formed in a star that died a while ago, but not in the way of, well, probably not <laughs> in the way that uh, like aliens dropped the clumps of gold on, on the earth. So yes, it, it's true, <laughs> I think. I've got a related question actually, this um, uh, online from Tony Vale. Um, is it correct that the merging uh, neutron star category on your periodic table slides are formed in the Kilanova detected recently by LIGO? Yes, yes. That those are that type of objects indeed. So yeah, that's something that you can detect in gravitational waves. These neutron stars spiraling into each other, <laughs> of course. <laughs> and that goes back to your question. That's another way for neutron stars to die. So two neutron stars. Um, moving around each other, spiraling in, merging, and becoming uh, yeah, a black hole, rather likely. So, yeah, and then create lots of heavy elements in the meantime. So, yeah. uh, thank you very much. Uh, just one question generally. Um, where does dark matter come into this? <laughs> I know we don't have very long, but you know, just so, well, briefly. Um, well, uh, not at all, <laughs> because, <laughs> because I'm uh, all the matter that I've been talking about is baryonic matter. So, well, the stuff that we are made of. Um, but yeah, of course, dark matter does play a role, but on very large scales. If you look at galaxies or more cosmology, only then you need to really wonder about uh, dark matter, but I don't think we should worry anytime soon of like a dark, well, because we would notice if there was dark matter here, because we would all just uh, uh, go up into photons. So, um, yeah. <laughs> so I have to disappoint you. <laughs> Only uh, re real matter. I don't know. Yeah, no. Uh, baryonic matter in this. Um, like, oh, amazing talk, by the way, but <laughs> continuing on that. Do you think when um, the dying star explodes, dark matter is also created oh. as well as the like, um, matter? Well, <laughs> um, I'm not sure because I, I, uh, that's not my field of uh, research. I'm more of a, a low mass star uh, person, but um, I'm perhaps, but not too much because otherwise the, the matter that is formed would be like annihilated and turned into photons. So, but I, I'm not too sure about that process. I'm sorry, <laughs> but yeah, it can't be a lot because we still have all these elements. Otherwise, they would disappear as well. So, thank 
thanks. So thanks for a lovely talk. So bringing it back to um, AGB stars and dust, um, I believe that there was some problems or some lack of understanding mm -hmm. in terms of there being too much dust in the young universe. Mm -hmm. And I wondered what currently the status quo is on when AGB stars look like the dominant sources of dust formation. That's a great question. <laughs> um, yeah, so um, just to give a bit of context to this question, so the the very very young universe when there weren't a lot of of, of carbon, nitrogen, and oxygen, how did these stars form dust? So that's that's a question like, and how much did these stars form dust? If you you know your uh, building blocks for dust weren't present yet, and um, it's it's not solved, that's for sure. Um, I'm not entirely, I, I don't know too much. <laughs> Again, I need to um, plead my ignorance about, well, not complete ignorance about this subject, but it's definitely something that's being looked at and that JWST will um, shine some light on as well, uh, just to see exactly how much does to, they produce. But we do know that, um, I think especially like carbon stars produce much more than you would expect uh, in the Magellanic clouds at least. <laughs> it's quite a trick. <laughs> yeah, thanks for a great talk. Thank I was you. just interested in what's your area of ah, right, interest yeah. in astrochemistry. So, I'll just maybe go back a few slides. <laughs> Sorry for the flashing. <laughs> um, so I study the chemistry of uh, AGB stars. So that's also why a large topic, a large part of the talk was about AGB stars. So I make uh, chemical models to sort of interpret uh, the observations. And uh, part of the studies that I've been doing was, for example, to include dust-gas interactions because these chemical models only included gas phase chemistry. Uh, but we do know that the dust is there to just see whether some things stick onto the dust. Um, and yeah, we do find some things, <laughs> by the way. And something, um, the research that I will like, will, will do in the uh, next years in Leiden uh, is to further look at dust formation because we've got some models for the inner region of the outflow, and then you've got the models for the outer bit. So I've already like sort of got those. Other people work on exactly how gas phase molecules cluster together and form larger stable clusters. And I would like to really incorporate that into uh, the model that I currently have to really see how we can go from gas phase molecules to dust grains. Lots of assumptions will still need to be made, but. Uh, would be great to have a start and that's done by collaborating with lab people as well as with uh, quantum chemists because some things you can't measure in the lab you need to ask your computer to uh, crunch some numbers for you so so that's what i do um, chemistry of agb starts chemical modeling and i talk to my observer friends whenever they see a strange molecule or molecules behaving strangely and I said, like, ah, <laughs> like, ah, why does it do that? Ah, why can't no nothing behaves? <laughs> but yeah, it's great fun. Um, might I ask about the difference between how super AGB stars are SG stars, like how do they die differently from AGB stars? The, like um, red supergiants. Yeah, so like, red supergiants yeah. will explode as a supernova. So I'll go back. Bear with me. We're almost there. <laughs> uh, yeah, here. So that's um, this graph. So a red supergiants, uh, the only massive stars will become red supergiants. So you need to have at least eight times the mass of our sun. If you don't, then you will not become a red supergiant and you will go to the red giant and the AGB phase. If you are massive enough, you will become one and you will explode as a supernova. So it all has to do with the initial mass, the birth rate of the star. If you're massive, red supergiant, supernova. If you're not, red giant, AGB outflow. Thanks. One more. Oh. <laughs> One more. Okay. Um, brilliant talk. Thank you. Um, 
Do you know um, how the different surface topologies from different types of dust impact, how protective um, they, um, how much protection you can give them from the ultraviolet radiation ah. that you are saying is a threat to them? Right, that's a great question. And yeah, so uh, I'll just pull, pull this slide back up. So you've got uh, different shapes, so some spherical, some nicely angular ones, but also these very fluffy grains. Uh, and exactly how good something is at extinguishing UV radiation, yeah, that, that the bill depends on the size of your dust as well as just the size distribution, like how many large grains and how many uh, small grains. So the shapes and sizes uh, do have an impact. And if, you, um, um, if you've got a more porous particle, perhaps that will be, well, that will have a, a slightly different impact on the extinction compared to something spherical or cylindrical, which is often assumed when you calculate the extinction of these uh, um, dust grains. So yeah, it does have an impact. Uh, and you can sort of calculate it, but for example, the effects of these porous molecules are not very well known because, well, how, how, do, you, how do you model such a uh, porous uh, molecule, uh, porous dust grain as well? So I hope that's sort of answering the mystery question from online. <laughs> uh, so you've got all these dust grains, but they're also in our meteor, uh, meteors and meteorites. That, so how does your research link up with meteorite research? Um, well, so I'd say that large part, well, as the dust enters of these AGB stars enters the ISM, it will, of course, get processed, uh, but it will end up, well, all of the, the dust in the meteorites, uh, some of them still contain uh, dust grains from the AGB phase. So the, it's not, well, these dust grains aren't, don't just um, leave the interstellar medium and become a planet completely unscathed. They are processed and there's also some dust growth in the ISM. So there is some, some link and then some dust grains do <laughs> survive this process. Uh, but I, I would say that um, they are still linked if you want to understand the evolution of your um, well, if you want to understand the meteor, you need to understand the protoplanetary disk, and then you need to understand whatever is in the ISM. So it sort of links back to it that way as well. That answers the question. Any more? Okay, Maureen, you've given a fantastic talk. Oh, thank uh, you. I mean, some of us know the basic story about how stars form and how stars die. You give them a, a perspective from a very different point of view. <laughs> the dust grains and the astrochemistry and how they're affected. And it was a very uh, perfectly done. Oh, thank and, you. Uh, and uh, goodness, lots of good thoughts. So thank, you. thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank you.